Hello, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to this week's Talking Stick Show. So sit back, relax, and we're in for an interesting, incredible show. So I'd like to firstly welcome my host, the great, the wonderful Laura Massey. Hello. Hi Dale, good to be here. Hi Hayley, nice to have you on Talking Stick. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And so Hayley's been on... Back in the day when I first started doing the Talking Stick shows, Haley came on, I think, three or four times in the end. Uh, I always invited her back because I really enjoyed having a conversation with her. So it's an absolute honour, Haley, to have you back on. I think the last time you were on the Talking Stick was about nine months ago. So what's new then? And for those listening who've not heard about you, tell the listeners a bit about yourself and what you do. Yes, so it's a real pleasure to be here and to have this extra growth of um yeah spectacularness basically that you've created so yeah we're chuffed about that um i yeah so i am an artist uh more in the realms of sacred art a shamanic practitioner and healer and also as you put it a fashion rebel i think you put which is definitely much more appropriate than a fashion designer because, um, yeah, I have broken every rule in the fashion college without a doubt. <laughs> yeah. Incredible stuff. And so a bit about your background then. So and shamanism and, ha- and that connection, because today we wanted to talk about shamanism and all the different aspects involved in how shamanism can grow us and how we can use shamanism to heal. So do you want to tell the listeners about your ex- experience with shamanism? How did that connect to the art as well? Well, I would, the word shamanism didn't even really come into my picture, into my life until I kind of understood what that meant. But when I did realize what shamanism was, it was a light bulb moment. And because I had already, I would see or perceive as I was already doing the work, but absolutely had no idea what it was. I didn't have any labels to say this, oh, this is this. It was just, I was just, my one thing um, is being connected to nature and always constantly wanting to do little rituals outside, like really simple little things. And if I was going to go right, right, right back, I would say I was into Christ- I was a Christian when I was probably about nine, ten, eleven, quite young. And I used to go to church, and and I I believe now it was because I was wanting I was knew that there was something more than just us humans, and I strived for connection of whatever that was. And so in my my innocence, I guess, I was going to say naivety, but it's actually my innocence. That's what, that's all I knew through my parents. So that's what I did. And I really went for it as well. I went, do you remember Billy Graham? And I don't, he's not alive anymore, but I went forward at Billy Graham. And um, and because I was, because of wanting that connection. And then as I became a bit more aware, these things were sort of like happening in my life experiences that I couldn't explain um like in dreams like flying at night going literally coming out of my body and going around the room and things like that and doing what I would now call a a ritual a ceremony in my bedroom with candles not knowing what I was doing because I was too young and then having an experience of flickering candles and then it going out and things like that that was when I was really young anyway and then as I got older, I started to do more ritual stuff and connect, just just explore different places and different people. And, and, and um, yeah, and then I started to realise, OK, this isn't Christianity that I'm feeling and I don't have anything against Christianity now. But I can't say it certainly made me go. It was just, 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 just not my thing and I respect it. But I realized it was very much earth based. And then, yeah, time would go on, time would go on. And then eventually I found myself doing some training with the Sacred Trust with Simon Buxton. And that's where I initially, or officially, probably should I say, not initially, officially 
stepped into the realms of um, this work. I'm 30. And that came from being in a place in my life where I was in a very dark place and I had to, I kind of was striving for something, like really striving for something. And then I knew about the sacred trust for quite some time, quite a few years, because I did the ecstatic dance training with Rebecca Hanscom as well. So I, I knew him through her, um, but it took me years to suddenly go, right, the sacred trust, yes. And then I applied for the to do three year training and done, and done other courses with, with them as well. So. And it really just opened up the door for me. And everything that I had done to that point literally was like a jigsaw puzzle. Just went slot, 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 slot. And I was able to articulate it and understand it in a way that was, you know, known to lots of other people too. Even though it's still quite taboo, I would say. Laura, go ahead. Do you want to, you, you yeah, look just, like you were able to speak? Then. <laughs> nodding away here, as you probably were. Lovely hearing, um, you know, your story and how in childhood, um, you know, you were doing those things and then latterly without realising really who you were until that, um, let's call it, I suppose, a dark night of the soul, wasn't it? Um, that gave you that big sort of aha and that big propel, mm. propelling forward. And I think there's... Um, many who will um who will resonate with that like me um and it's it's just great hearing um s someone else a sister out there who's who's done the same same sort of thing as dale and me and and so on and uh without really knowing that we were probably born to be shaman that we planned it before we came and we've probably done it many other lifetimes but i love the variety of um, shaman that are out there so I'd love to hear more about the sort of um, ceremonies and rituals you do and and how you experience uh, shamanism how you deliver it to the to the world the the thing I'm on a journey within this work that I will be on until I cross over so I'm forever clearing out. So if I'm not doing the work, then I, I, I can't really offer it to other people. So I'm constantly, I know that I, I'm experienced. I know that I'm in a, I've done a lot of work on myself as well as understanding about teaching and healing work. But without a doubt, I will continue to work on my sovereignty. And the thing that I've really come to realize and understand is about the word sovereignty. So I guess one of my biggest passions is to inspire and entice people to stand up and be their own selves, be their true selves. And I'm I'm doing that under the umbrella of, of shamanism and creativity and things like that and movement, which is all, all, all the same, all the same. There's no separation between all of those things for me. And so how I'm offering it out into the world is through the eyes of me wanting to inspire people to be there, to embrace their sovereignty and their true self. Um, yeah, and that is this, this partnership with spirit, right, as we know. So everything, whenever I, I act upon anything, it's all, I'm always journeying, I'm always just walking in nature or doing some divination work, hey, you know, show me because I don't want to come from my ego. I wouldn't come from my ego. I want to ask the spirits and they're in charge. You know, I am the vessel, I am that, but they're in charge. So that's the first port, port of call for me, as probably all of us in, who work in these realms. So creativity, like I've mentioned, and ritual and ceremony always driven from them. And I have to say, I have, you know, they deliver very well. You know, they've got those like, little and big ceremonies out there. And, and going on the ceremony factor, I really believe that it doesn't... You can go into a big, massive five-day, one-day ceremony all day when you're delving deep in, and that's powerful, right? But I absolutely believe intention drives everything. And if your intention drives a very, very simple act of writing down 
an intention that you want to let go of and burning it on the fire, if the intention is there, then I don't doubt for a moment that that is going to manifest in people's lives. So it doesn't have to be this kind of big hoo-ha with all the singing, mm -hmm. dancing, you know, mm -hmm. around. It can be really simple, the intentions there. So what was it like being in the Christian traditions, then going into shamanism? What was it like for you experiencing on your on your course you did and the training you did? What were some of the things you, I wouldn't say personal experience, you'd have to tell me those, but what was it like transitioning and figuring and learning from, a, say, a tradition or oral teachers about truth and reality and the nature and the aspects of the wind? What was it like for that? Well, I went from... Because I was searching, so I really understood Christianity when I was young. And then, in truth, I went the complete opposite. Almost like, I, I don't, I just, I kind of became a rebel, not a rebel of it, but I just kind of, I just didn't, this is just my journey, and it's not how it is now. I just want to make that very clear. And so I became very, I just didn't like the, the it's, it's a religion, and I just didn't like how, formalized everything was and we were told that it was good and evil and la 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 so i guess i had a this is a very personal disassociation with it for quite some years until i grew up actually until i realized and i just thought actually i respect that i really really respect that and i actually honor that and i love i love that aspect of it it's just not for me and but having said that there are elements of it that are really similar like all religions are all seeking the same thing even and shamanism being in that same bracket we're after we're there is something else that's beyond just us creation god allah whatever you know spirit great spirit etc etc names are endless so that made me realize that there is just no separation between any of them and I respect it as much as as much as the work I do so I became yeah that's that's kind of my journey from there to here and um, I just feel more comfortable in the work that I'm doing that's me you know that's me that's my sovereign incredible yeah, it's so lovely hearing someone who um walks their talk isn't it dale yes it is and that's why she's come yeah. on four times yeah. <laughs> that's why we keep inviting her back on because yeah. yeah and i love it that you use the word sovereignty because there are some um who don't teach that within um shamanism and for me that is you know it, it's that self-mastery or mastery of the self and the sovereignty of your own self um, is so important in this work otherwise you don't know what you're handing your your mind body and spirit over to do you so it's really great to hear you talk about sovereignty as well Absolutely. and so, so sorry laura go ahead okay so tell us about your artwork i had a quick look at your website what inspires that and you've got um, some on the wall behind you, if anyone can see. Yeah, yeah. There. So these are um, sculptures um, with fabric and um, manipulating it. So they, these these ones particularly are around the void, and I base I kind of want to throw all that I am, all of my passions into one incredible handwoven basket. <laughs> of course hmm. so my artwork is absolutely the same as my shamanism my shamanic work so through shamanism we have we are we're, we perceive from all of our senses and all of my artwork is entirely intuitive and um and I, it, it's done in a kind of not all of the pieces but in a kind of in a respectful ceremonial way and um, it's driven sometimes from journey work. So I do journeys and, and, and then create some visions. But um, also the aspect, the aspect of the void is that when you stand at that threshold, 
we take a risk, right? You know, there's like, you stand at the threshold and we have a choice whether we want to jump in or not. And beyond that, in the void, in the all and everything, in that topsy-turvy space, there are infinite possibilities. And again, it's, you know, it's the same with my healing work. It's the same with my teaching. And it's the same with my artwork. You know, all, all around that aspect of like, let's step beyond the threshold and dive in. And, um, and also there's aspects in some of the series I've done where um, the idea of actually journeying through an Axis Mundi, for example. So you're actually going through something. And then, and then there's deeper aspects of transition and, you know, going through something and into another world. So whether that's through a journey, through just meditation, through walking in nature, or literally through the death process of, of, of life and death. So, yeah, that's kind of like generally a, gen, gen, a real general explanation of my art. But I, I, it's very interesting because the void or these, this, which you can see everywhere, it's in, in all of my artwork, it kind of, that's a three-dimensional thing that goes into something. Again, when I was young, and it was someone that reminded me this, I used to draw that all the time. <laughs> all the time and I just obsessed with space and tunnels and you know so it's really weird that now because I had I didn't do that for quite some time and now I'm just like gone straight back to this oh my god I was doing this when I was young <laughs> I wonder if you know I wonder if there was a draw between a bridge between the two I don't know but my art is who is such a big part of who I am you know I am creative and it's my one of my biggest passions of of expression as well you know you let everybody should be doing art everybody is an artist i get so sad when people say i'm not an artist and i'm like yes you are i want to run workshops on that aspect actually to really you know inspire people to yeah like absolutely me. and it's getting people into that self-belief that, that one life they might have had, or many lives, they might have been able to draw maybe more than they think they can now. And, and it's drawing, drawing on. <laughs> it's pulling in that life, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it? It's it's calling in that aspect of yourself again, isn't it? To um, to step forward and just, just give it a go. And you're right, it's very freeing. It's very um, expressive. And as you say, it's how you express yourself too. And they're very womb like your um your artwork, isn't it, as well, which obviously is 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 the void as as well, being the womb Absolutely. of yeah. great mystery or great spirit or or the universe or whatever your particular belief is. But yes. yeah, beautiful. Sorry, Dale, did you want to say something? Oh, it's okay, Laura. All good. Um so the, we've got a question here which we'd oh, like yes. to ask. So from Sarah uh Canode is why is shamanism so judged by society? Is shamanism like voodoo? I grew up in the Caribbean and there was so much mystery around it. So, if you, Hayley, if you want to answer that. <laughs> My answer is, I actually don't know why. I mean, even now today, it's 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 seen as, as woo-woo. And, you know, even I would choose, not everybody I would share it with, because some people find it a bit... Um, overwhelming a bit they're scared of it I think it's pure fear because we can't see it you know we can't see it and and unfortunately the the or the history or the the media about shamanism is actually comes across quite dark you know it's like oh it's you're working with the spirits what's the spirits and it's like but it's as we know it's not that at all it's full of absolute love and compassion and and you know we we journey to the spirit world when they're loving compassionate beings um they're not i don't believe in evil so you know other people may do i don't know but they're you know it's just there is no evil it's just suffering beings or um you know whatever you want to call it but i think i think the reason why is because society has has put something on it which creates a lot of fear because it's completely unknown. 
and um, and actually, in, on the flip side of that, it really does work. That's it, and I feel like sometimes in society, like with shamanism people need something where they know everything and what it is and there's a huge label to it with shamanism there's so much mystery to it and the mystical and it's it's about experience isn't it it's you can be taught as much shamanism you possibly taught but if you don't fucking experience it then it means fuck all and that's for me was learning shamanism is one of the most important things for experience you have to have the experience um so yeah <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's like that, isn't it, with the global narrative? So it gives a different perception to something. So, for example, if you say to, I know I might say to some of my friends, oh, I buy organic food and organic has a certain um, cultural perception. If I say I'm buying food that's not grown with chemicals, then they understand better what I'm talking about it actually gets more to what it's about. So sometimes I don't use the word shamanism or I'm a shaman or anything. I do, you know, I work with the natural world, like you said, Hayley, or I do self-mastery, but it involves working with the natural world because the natural world is the other dimensions. The natural, the natural world is the spirit world. That's not an unnatural world. It's just that it's been made unnatural by the global narrative. It's totally natural to the three of us here and to many of the people listening. So it's getting over that sort of stigma and that vision that it's been given, isn't it? That uh, that that label of it. And the more people um, like us three here and Andrew and Matty and loads of other people who do this um, make this a more... Um, I don't know whether to use the word normalize or make it part of our daily life, mm. then it brings it more in into mainstream. I mean, certainly my friends are much more acceptable of me, I think now than um, than than maybe they were because you can you can bring it into this world as you know, Haley. You can bring it in and make it enjoyable. It's meant to be enjoy the whole thing of it all isn't it it's meant to be done in joy the prayers are meant to be done in joy the ceremonies the ritual and you're meant to get a good outcome or co-create a positive co-creation with great mystery and great spirit and the universe and the spirit world whatever you want to call them it's actually here to enhance our life because we're natural born beings aren't we of earth we're here to work with the earth so i think it's um you can yeah, shamanism is a, is a difficult, sometimes can be a misleading, maybe, but that's only because of, of, the, of what's been put on it, isn't it, by society. And that's it. It is, it's going out, experiencing, feeling, having a fire. Like, you could all get majority of people in the world to have a fire or go out under the stars or just something natural and you're like ah that's shamanism yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. we in in aspects we all do have and do shamanism in different areas of our life even if we work full-time and so on and um, so the stigma behind shamanism shamanism as well i think a lot of movies a lot of darkness from before is kind of like led through a little bit on the movies with shamanism and negative voodoo stuff so we've got this perception of shamanism as we grow up as a kid from movies and so on but it's so not like that it's so natural and it's so beautiful and have fun as well if you want to go into shamanism you want to learn shamanism remember not to take the ser take the serious stick from your ass <laughs> and enjoy yourself really mm. fucking enjoy yourself smile allow yourself to make mistakes and be great as well and anything you want to add to that, Hayley? <laughs> right on. The... Yeah. 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 I mean, Hayley looks like she enjoys it, don't you? Yeah. And look at, you know, beautiful artwork. Art, artwork is, you know, it, it's it's a, a beautiful expression of your shamanism, but we don't have to call it that. Can, no, exactly. can just just be artwork. I mean, that it can link into into the world. The natural world can link into the the. Um, other world as well or the sorry the 3d world yeah absolutely yeah humor is definitely the uh a big factor certainly in uh when people come to my circles and my teachings it's just got to be there so i, I yeah. totally agree with you in that one 
and that's it the childlike state there's something so powerful and special about being the child and when you really fully experience yourself as a child again because you are still a child but so the society tells you we're not there's such a high energy about it and it's so comforting and this is why like me laura and andrew we always take the piss out of each other and <laughs> with this seriousness business with what we're doing and what we're creating we have to have comedy in it at all times. We have our serious moments, we have meetings and serious shit happen sometimes, but majority of the time we're taking the piss and having a laugh because at the end of the day, that's it. comedy is so, so important to yeah, just to kind of break up the seriousness. Yeah, totally. Well, it's a sacred thing, isn't it? Clown, you know, that kind of yes. That yes. playing with that idea, very topsy-turvy, but using humor and then actually underneath it is some real, deep healing work going on yes yes i agree um hayley and also do you find that um the unseen world has a laugh with you too oh yes. i find that yeah and i you can you know you sort of look up because that's a, just naturally what i do anyway i look up and and laugh and say oh you got me there or or just something will happen a synchronicity or something and you think or a dream Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Some yeah. Some quite amusing stuff happens in dreams, and I think, yeah, <laughs> of course, of course, they've got a sense of humour. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, even when I'm with um, like a one-to-one -one client, I'm like, I'm I'm now deep, deeply immersed, deeply merged, da -da -da. and then I get shown something, and I'm like, and I'm like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> okay, you know, I. Okay, and um, because I completely trust, I follow it, you know. So, you know, but you know, I, and I'm laughing about it because it is sometimes like really, but yes, it is, you know, because it's that that topsy turvy kind of like yeah, it's funny, but that's where the work's at. This is what you have to do with that client. Okay. So, how important is trust in trust in yourself to you, Haley? How important is that on your journey and in the work you do? I have to because it's so easy to for that judgment to come in, especially when you're working with um, the spirits or the unseen realm. Some, you know, you're you're journeying, and if I didn't trust in myself, in what I'm perceiving, um, if I didn't trust in the work that I'm creating then I wouldn't be doing it. You know, I wouldn't be teaching it. I wouldn't be doing shamanic journeying. I wouldn't be creating artwork, simple as that. So I have to have fallen into the arms of trust of myself and also what's around me. And tr it is myself because I have to trust what I'm perceiving, you know. And, and when I'm teaching, the, the biggest question that, that I get asked, you know, oh, you know am I making this up? because they're not trusting them, like, just trusting it, you know, just trusting it. It doesn't matter what happens if you did, you know, what happens if you didn't make it up and it was real. Yes. You know, again, going to the humour thing, have fun. Um, and it so can, trust connects is. back to broken faith as well with the trust. And if people do have trust issues, then they've got to look into the past where they weren't in trust or they had broken faith, where they gave up being source connected and that's so important in your own journey. My mum's a great example of it. She's She has mystical experiences happening to her. She believes it for an hour. Then the next day she doesn't believe it anymore because she just thinks, oh no, I don't trust it really. Um, and she's had a lot of things in the past. Same with me, where I had to go back into the past and mend those parts of me which were broken, where I was growing up and I lost faith in the world. No one was showing me um, tools like shamanism. It was kind of like I had to find it all for myself. And I kind of gave up because of Christianity and all the rules they had. It just didn't feel right to me. Uh, so I had to like go back around. I started experimenting, going out, <coughs> taking drugs and so on until I got to the point where I uh, hit rock bottom. And rock bottom is one of the best places I could have gone to at that time because it made me rebuild and re rebirth into a new person completely. That's where that's where it's at, isn't it? In the um, in the in the deep trauma or the deep oh, destruction of life, to where you can actually 
it's the dismemberment, isn't it? If you get completely dismembered in life, then at that point, that's when you can remember. Remember, absolutely. Absolutely. And start putting the pieces and parts of yourself back together mm. in a different way, isn't it? Yeah. With an understanding of, of working with the natural world. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we have a question from Amy. Haley. can you share with us one or two things you find important in your shamanism practice each day? Um, the, the first thing I would say is to, which I know you're both going to agree with this, is go out into nature, which I do. I go out into nature every morning and I acknowledge the physical face of spirit, meaning nature. So in the morning, there's bird songs. I'm listening. I'm engaging. There's a relationship there. And understanding that I am related to the trees and related to all the little things that are happening and finding my feet on the earth and feeding into that and allowing that to come up through me and into my being. And secondly, being grateful being grateful for this moment, being grateful for the sun rising once again for us all. You know, I'm here to breathe in this earth and then go on my day, totally normal. But I'm taking that one, two, five minutes, however long it is, of just pausing in stillness and acknowledging that everything is alive and I am it and it is me. So that's, yeah. And that frequency you've tuned into, you're taking with you throughout your day. I know we need to top it up regularly, yeah. but it's getting yourself in that position, like you've said, and it, that, that requires, you know, it does take effort, doesn't it? Because sometimes it's it's easier not to do these things than to actually put in the, uh, the commitment to yeah. having like a, a daily discipline, even if it's, it, you can say it's just walking in nature, but it is a daily discipline to right. um to get yourself and with that sort of frequency that healing frequency yeah exactly and you know that's what, what i just explained to them is there is really accessible so there, obviously there's other work that i would I, I i can reel off now but it would be not accessible to some people because they'd be like well how do you journey then or whatever so that's completely accessible and powerful and anybody could do that and it might not be in nature. It might be actually just sitting in and meditating, or it might be um, stretching or moving. Um, yeah. But so many of us do start, I think, with that nature connection, um, because, like you were saying earlier, it's like you go to um, you go walking in nature, or you go and you pick up and you bring a stick home or a stone home, or something you found, and then, then you extend it, you go start going to sacred sites and maybe bringing something back from a sacred site that you've picked up, a feather, or something like that, and doing some little ritual with it. Yeah. So it does, it's all, because it's all about the natural world and us working with it, um, with the natural earth hologram, isn't it? That I think that nature has got to be the, the real catalyst yeah. for, that that sort of um, entry into to this sort of work really yes. and it's an inspiration as well isn't it obviously you take inspiration in in your artwork you know from from the natural world too don't you and oh, from nature absolutely even just it was i was in a garden today and it was so stunning like visually it was so stunning and i realized i was and i felt good but i realized it was it wasn't until I actually looked and thought, wow, it's stunning here. But I, I, I kind of paused for a moment and I thought, I feel good. And it's not, I haven't actually really noticed, like, visually what's here until I've actually made the effort to. And I realized I feel really good because I'm just in it and energetically around. I mean, I was literally surrounded by flowers and trees and, you know, so I was just feeling it. And so I acknowledged that, ah, oh, that's, that's why. It's not because I'm seeing it. We don't have to do that. Because sometimes we walk in nature and we just think, God, I feel, I feel really good. I just, you know, most people like to go out in nature and most people probably don't know why. I don't know why, I just want to do it. Well, 
we don't need to know why because it's just imprinted in the earth and the earth is a part of us what i believe so there's this instant thing that happens woven in that connects us with nature so we just feel good it's just simple. and that's that's beautiful, Haley, and that's why a lot of people struggle with nature and and relaxing and going feeling good when they go out for a walk is because they're always searching for something, and with that search they kind of they don't get the full experience of being a human. Like you say, the surrender, the knowingness, the 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 being part of source, being part of the nature, being part of the world, is a feeling and it's a knowing instead of going out and always as humans we want things instant gratification or we want the next iphone or we want this and that when you go out into nature it's not about wanting but it's about listening and experiencing walking and there's an aspect to it where i walk now and i'm like this is fucking amazing walking like because when i was a kid or when i was a teenager i didn't feel like this now i'm actually listening and i'm part of it all and that oneness which you're talking about is incredible it's so inspiring to to feel oneness and those listening to go out into nature and feel instead of looking, going out to expect, just be and really feel the environment you're in. It's a deep listening, I think, with your with your whole body. So I don't think it's quite the same if you've got your earbuds in or your iPod, whatever it is, and you're running. You're on because your focus then is that you're you're out to do a run, isn't it? For me, that isn't. It's great that you're out and it's great you're exercising, but if you want real natural connection, you've got to drop all that and you've just got to be out there yourself, like Haley's saying, and just immerse yourself in those frequencies. And they are such healing frequencies as well, aren't they, as we've just been saying. So how do you work with like um, ancestral trauma, Haley? dealing with ancestral trauma in, in your type of work well i would say that is in in relation to um curse work yeah, which yeah. is, well, is yeah. Very, yeah. yeah which is oh i don't know people kind of like oh you're a curse what's that you know because <laughs> <laughs> it is actually oh my god what have been cursed by who by or go away you know and what does that mean anyway yeah but yeah. <laughs> ancestral cursing, <coughs> we could automatically think that it's our parents or grandparents, but it's not generally not um, necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. Ancestral cursing can happen way, way back in our line, our bloodline, our physical bloodline, on and on. So there's some kind of lineage line that's happening to us living right now. And if a curse has happened, way 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 back or not so way back where well I, I won't give an example now but if a curse was set on that line that effect on that particular person that that curse was set upon if the intention was for it to carry on and on and on say down the female line the female line can be affected in the same way repeating the same patterns as you know the, the mother and the grandmother and and sometimes it's really clear as well to us it's like i'm, I'm doing that same thing that's um my mum my mum's doing or my grandparents were doing etc cetera, etc cetera. and and so until that curse has been unraveled and freed and so that is set free therefore that person at that point can then be free themselves and will not carry that forward and what are some of the practices you have for doing that that you can share with us? What would well, the, it's um, it would be not it would typically be done through one to one client. Um, can be done remotely or um, obviously in person. It kind of it really doesn't make any difference because you're working in particularly with curses, to be honest, because you're working in the spirit world and. Um, yeah, so it's it's done remotely. I set. I mean, it's kind of unless I go into detail about how I would do it, which I don't particularly want to do. No, no, either. no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it, it it would be say a client would come. I would always do a diagnostic journey, so journey to the spirit world, just to is that aligned? Is that is that a curse? Yes, it is. 
and then and then I would, it could be an ancestral curse it could be a self curse it could be a curse from someone that's still living and then then I would do the work in partnership with the spirits of so spirits because it's curse work as well as a practitioner be fully um, protected and the spirits so there's there's almost a distance between myself and the spirits the spirits are really doing the work here whereas sometimes if I was going to do soul retrieval with a client I'm very action 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 as well as absolutely being in partnership with curse work you keep a little distance because you're working if if if, if you trip over a wire for example um, meaning metaphorically a spirit wire for a trap for set up for um so you know they don't want to be seen don't want to be heard but they could, that that thing can happen i have to be fully guarded fully protected so that isn't going to happen or is it like can you uncover any things that needs to be revealed hmm. if that answers i'm just going to put a light on because it's a bit yes, dark it's getting dark there isn't it so just to answer a question as well so shane you've asked a few questions and i have read some of them so i'll answer some of them uh, can we send energy and i guess you mean sending positive energy is that what you mean um laura can you read into more of that can we send energy i think we can um do you mean it is as in energy healing yeah i can't i can't see the question can you not see yeah, the chat if, okay if you're sending it to somebody please don't yes. do it without asking them of course, and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that to Shane. But yes, I mean, absolutely, as Hayley will confirm, you can do distant healing because in the unseen world, there's no distance. So it, they could be next to you or the other side of the world. I mean, energy's energy's energy. It's, um, you know, we'll, we'll, you can work with it in any way you choose and imprint on it how you choose. Hopefully you're, you're imprinting on it as a sovereign... Uh, sacred being yeah and that's it and i remember my journey with psychic surgery and doing healings i remember years ago when one person wanted a treatment from australia and i remember thinking in my mind when i first started i was like holy shit i was like am i gonna be able to do this australia it's like <laughs> that, that that was then all of a sudden from then the bit so covid came and my clients all went to online and it was one of the best things ever because I, I started having no competition between my face-to-face -face and my online clients where it just got to the point now where there was such trust with myself it was like they're in the room there was no difference so I was like at the start people it's hard for people to perceive with the brain and when you start thinking with the brain in psychic surgery or uh, uh, shamanic practice practices it's hard but when you have a knowingness and a feeling those are one of the most important tools within it Yeah, totally. Are there any more questions there that Shane wants? Answered? Yeah, so he's, he's asked a few and I'm not. So it's send energy. Yeah, the sending energy thing. I was What was that question again? Because I was because there is there is energy where you can literally where you're angry or you're shouting at somebody and energy like you said hmm. um, yes. can go out and then that can attach to us. Um, so that needs clearing. That's a that, that's not. I wouldn't call cursing that's like negative thought patterns or negative energies that are thrown out that that can catch on anybody really yeah that, that, is that what you would consider the setup for like um psychic attacks as well Haley? how would you describe yeah. a psychic um, attack as we're talking about this it depends because if it's done psychic attack well if it's done with intention then it could, I, I kind of I can't answer the question directly because I'd always journey to the spirits and ask them. But it could be either, I would say. So a mm. psychic attack could be if it's literally at you, and especially if it's repetitive, if it keeps coming at you and at you and at you, then it can really have an effect. Yeah. But energetically yeah. as well, it could just be the same. But that would yeah. need extraction and energy extraction. How would you describe a psychic attack, Dale? Uh, I would describe a psychic attack as someone's potentially their parasympathetic or their shadow or their ego or their unhealed parts of themselves attacking. Um, and you find it time and time again. I've had it in friendships where people have just turned into absolute idiots. 
um, and they've started obviously projecting and attach. I'd not say attaching, but throwing their own shit at me, and I call it verbal vomit. So I've had many verbal vomits thrown at me. I've had demon vomit over me before, um, where I've depossessed a lady, and the demon screamed vomit all over me, which took me three days to get out of myself. I felt really weird for three days. So I've experienced all all type of projections, and again, even projections from you guys listening and the in the in the show. I do do work on myself to protect myself from projections as well. Uh, because when you've got fa- over a thousand people watching and there are a few projections, they can affect us. Uh, and I've noticed that from working with Andrew and when I'd started doing the shows and I came onto Andrew's show on the Thursday and we were getting like 3,000 people a, a week watching and all of a sudden I felt really anxious. And I was like, what the fuck is, where is this anxiety coming from? And it was, it was pro- collective projections at me. So regularly I have to start purging. I have to do the inner work on clearing my field, protecting myself. I'm not judging anyone at all. It's just natural. It's just normally what happens. Anybody with with a lot of people watching can receive projections. That's just the nature of it. But it's about being responsible and clearing yourself from them, protection and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes within those there are judgments or, or for me, um, psychic attacks that I've had, I think I've built up from many, many, like Hayley said, repetitive, very negative thoughts like maybe from from a disgruntled ex and uh, or, or even <laughs> when you're still in relationship with them and it's going really badly <laughs> they can build up and and come at you and I felt them you know come at me in dream time and and things like that so almost for me being like an, a, a ball of energy or a wind of, of something very negative but also I agree with you Dale I think we can also create our own our own psychic attacks, you know, when we let down our, our sovereignty, when we're lapsing in those, uh, you know, in that sovereignty. Yeah, we can be really hard on ourselves, for sure. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And it's about not going into fear as well when it does happen. And that was one of the one of the teachings throughout the years, what I've gone through in my own life, was seeing so a lot of darkness within clients. I had one time where... I just had real, really dark clients with demons and, and all sorts of stuff attached to them, um, very depressed and so on. And and that felt for me was spirit was engaging me ready for my next level of being able to deal with that energy without being overwhelmed. Um, and when I did the demon the demon vomit over spring equinox, the last spring equinox, the, it, was, it was fucking hard. And like the next three days after, like, if I was that person eight years ago, I probably would have maybe stopped the spiritual journey for a bit because it was so like, it was like it was a test of my faith and to keep going and, and no matter what, I've got in this journey for myself and my trust and faith for everything is so important to me now. Um, so it is remembering to have fun with it. If shit darkness does happen to you where you go through some shit like that, make sure you have that comedy to flip the frequency on it because it's so important. Some of us can just hide, have trauma happen to us, and that's it. We shut our life off for everything again. Yeah, I don't know if you remember, we, we ought to tell um, Haley this. On Andrew, on one of his shows, when he was dealing with somebody who had something like that, I'm not saying it was a demon, I'm not sure what it was, but he said, sit it in the corner with the dancer's hat on. Do you remember that one, Dale? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great way to inject... Um, humor into it and actually dismantle any of the the fear energies you know ar- ar- around it isn't it Absolutely. what about what about ancestral trauma if you can go into a little bit about that Haley, how you would how you would deal with that with a client without getting too you know in depth or saying anything you don't want to bring up now um now do you mean because i would say that's different from cursing so yes. um through trauma through childhood you mean or through or yeah or through... even well i was like ancestral trauma um more like uh, maybe alcoholism or something that's handed down which isn't necessarily a curse but it's definitely a trauma isn't it that's handed down yeah so i mean if it was say if it was someone who because i do actually work a lot with people who um are in uh, who are in 
recovery, for example, or even just coming out of um, addiction. Now, I think it's such, because it's a classic scenario where um, you're searching for something, um, you're trying to fill yourself up with something that you don't know. And when we, if we have um, some trauma in our lives, we become empty. So there's these empty spaces within us. It's just, you know, if we, if we can say it as a general picture. So something happens, it boom, comes in, takes a bit of our soul away. Something else comes in, takes a bit of our soul away. And so we, we're almost like this kind of sponge just walking around and then soaking up those things and searching for things to fill those places up. So we drink, we take drugs, drugs, trying to find something. So I would, if something like that came to me, I would work with that on a one-to-one, -one, obviously through journey work, but um, particularly probably with extraction and soul, soul retrieval would desperately be needed. Um, and I don't think I can move over the fact that if it was brought through an ancestors, well, there's obviously something that needs to be cut, mm. you know, like mm -hmm. a pattern that needs to be cut, I would say. Mm. So it's either cursing, something that's come through, or something that needs to be broken. And then also if they can become whole themselves, become, their soul become whole again, then that's when they can shift themselves forward. And they have the ability to do that, I believe with the healing work and as you said earlier on this is where sovereignty is so important because getting the fullness of your i am presence or however you would describe it amy um in your body and being in control of your parasympathetic sympathetic and vagus nerve and wherever programs come in and whatever is the key to stopping that that you know that trauma from carrying on isn't it in your life it's it's part of it's very much part of the healing isn't it and yes. the mastery mastery of yourself yes you gotta you kind of in those situations we're so down on ourselves you know we're so in that self self-sabotaged place where we despise ourselves so we just want to shut ourselves off from society so if there was some pathway that could be opened up to saying you're worthy and it's time for you to maybe take small steps to knowing that you're worthy and how can we do that so there's a thing i particularly do called sacred mentoring which is working with one-to-one -one clients on their own needs but also with all of that like how, how how through so there's healing work involved but also they do a lot of ritual work and and things for themselves to build little platforms one by one and so if if they can ha if they've got will and determination and passion they'll move forward they'll move through it they'll be able to detach themselves from that that pattern I believe. so let's talk about you talk about soul retrieval and i'm familiar with soul retrieval would you like to just explain a little bit about what soul retrieval means for those who are unaware yeah so when we have this incredible temple, this physical body here that is very, you know, it's earthly. And then spirit comes to our, meets to earth and comes, meets with the body in the womb, um, in birth. So then in, in, that, in that form, the spirit, the soul is pure, it's beautiful, it's just, it's whole. And then through life when we're born, not generally generally not early stages but as the years go by that soul can get damaged so our spirit that light being that energy force whatever you want to call it that's that that thing that we know is with us we're not just human we're not just physical flesh sorry and when that soul becomes damaged through trauma through accidents through maybe cursing as well through well, lots of different ways, through literal physical accidents, amputations, you know, all of those things, our soul gets affected and then it goes off into the spirit world and hides away, generally in a safe place, because you know that fight or flight that, that animals do when they get, when a, when a, they get attacked, 
they shake, you know, they shake. And it's because their spirit is leaving, leaving their body just before they the attack happens because they know how to do it. We don't know how to do that. But what happens is our soul becomes fragmented and lost in the spirit world. So as a practitioner, my job would be to journey and find those soul parts and then bring them home with probably with a story as well of when that soul part needs to needs to come back. And what happens again, like when I was saying about the sponge effect, when when those soul parts leave us, there's empty holes. So they fill up with negative energy. So that drains us, we feel tired or we have, you know, repetitive things go on in our life or we have physical pains happen in our body because these energies are filling up those places that actually should be the soul because the soul needs to come back. So again, it's all to do with sovereignty again, because when the soul becomes home when fully home and all those beautiful lost soul parts come home, then we can be, we haven't got this veil anymore. We can see clearly. Incredible. Yeah. Beautiful. And that's it. And, and from my uh, experience of soul retrieval as well, it's interesting because it is like each each one what comes back has a story to tell. <laughs> and it's like, it's like I'm finally back in and it's been up to this or came out at this era of time back then. Um, and it is like each session, there's just so many different soul shards coming in. And it's not just one, there's just hundreds and hundreds. I don't know how many of each person but for me personally, they just keep coming back all the time of all the different lifetimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And some of them can be, you know, big soul parts that have been lost for a very long time and so needed to come back because it's really just, you know, disrupting that person's life. But it can be really small ones as well. Really simple. And they can carry on being lost because we suddenly find ourselves in situations and, oh, not soul part is gone. <laughs> Bring it back. Yes. <laughs> it's left the building. Yeah. No, come back. <laughs> Could make a TV program, The Soul Shard Hunter. <laughs> yes. yeah, that would be a good Let's one. Do it. <laughs> I think before I even um, learnt anything about it, Hayley, I was, I was doing that in my dream time. Oh wow! Um, and it's lucky because I um, knew Andrew at the time that I actually had a resource to ask and find out exactly what I was doing. But I was collecting um, a soul shard from a hell realm for somebody. And uh, I sort of I, I sort of knew, but I didn't really understand about the work we did for other people, um, whether it's through journeying or dream time. So I think maybe we also do it in our dream time sometimes without being aware of it. I'm sure I'm sure we must do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I, I had a client just last week and I was told that she had to find her soul part in her dreams that night. Uh, yeah, there was a soul okay. part. I saw it as clear as day, knew what it was, but I wasn't the one to do the work. And I said, you set the intention before you go to bed and that soul part's going to come back to you. And you just, again, you just need to trust. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, and they can come in, in in some very interesting ways as we discovered on a a show we did quite a few weeks ago, Dale, where I had the soul shard that came in through my throat chakra. Wow. Oh, God. And it shifted yeah. my residual image of... Hayley so I had needs a photo to see this. I'm going to put it head. up. Yeah. I've got it. Have Ready? you got it? Yeah. Yeah, Hayley might like to see that. Oh, my God. <laughs> so... Oh, my God. Yeah, so... Um, it just so I think this obviously the universe aligned it so that uh, my partner at the time actually he was taking a photo of me wearing just this silly hat, but that's what happened with the photo. Oh my um, Then Andrew said my soul shard came in so fast it actually um, moved my residual image. So wow. it's quite it's quite fun. It, yeah, but it does. It's a great demonstration of. Uh, yeah <laughs> it's quite bizarre isn't it oh huge bow yeah <laughs> yes it does yeah, it does. yeah um, quite quite bizarre that one but yes so um and i didn't know what was happening to me so i think anybody out there who doesn't understand what's going on you've got three practitioners here who do 
and and more in Matty Waller who works with Two Feathers Medicine as well and obviously Andrew and Absolutely. you know something that um, can be confusing if you're if you're early on your journey can't it dealing with yeah. all shards yes absolutely if you don't know when it's like especially you know you don't know what's happening to you and then they come to us and I, I you know something's happening i don't understand it and it's like well you know maybe they don't need to understand it they just turned yeah. up that's great you know yes yes you can you can put them back together so, as it were yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's what i i've learned a lot is about even though i understand a lot but not ne i don't know everything and sometimes i don't have to understand everything and that's one of the biggest growths I've had. And I, I think letting go and being more of a natural person is letting go of all of that. Um, the control, the con and not like you always want to know everything. I always used to want to know everything about spirit. What's this and what's that? But now I just like, I couldn't give a shit about some things. And I'm so happy I couldn't give a shit finally. Yeah. <laughs> that everything's a story and everything has a, has a, there's something connected to that. And I was like, I have to stop myself from doing this because it, mostly negative really stuff i wouldn't say i was negative thinking but being like that is quite a negative process always trying to get the answers for everything we're conditioned that way though aren't we to find the answer to stuff you know yes. whether it's crosswords or cluedo or whatever it is it's almost a conditioning we there has to be an answer and i think it was andrew who said great mystery will never be solved and I quite like that because what's the point of having a mystery if you can <laughs> you can solve it? You want the continuing mystery. I mean, that's the joy and the journey of life, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. And isn't it great when when somebody knows you know more than you do? It's like they they kind of give you the answers if you can let go of that need of having to 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 give all the all the answers to everything. When someone says, "Well, actually," does and and it feels right. It's like it's great. I've learned something today. Yeah, I love it took me a long now. time to, yeah. to get to that being brave enough to say well, I don't know actually yeah. I would always try and come up with something <laughs> lame though it was and it's actually better to say actually I don't know and I'm I'm okay with that you know yeah. that, but that's part of the self self worthiness journey that you were talking about earlier as well yeah being okay with you and not having everything to prove Absolutely, not worrying what other people think as well. Yeah, it's a huge one. Like, yeah. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. So, from the years of you being a practitioner, then, so what are some of the similarities from the years you've been doing it? I'm not saying like what exactly they are, but what are some of the similarities you find in people like living in a human experience? What you deal with mostly in sessions because. Or does it come in waves? Does sessions change from time to time? What's it like for you as a practitioner? Um, I wouldn't say there is a pattern, but I would definitely say the, the thing that always pops its head up is um, disbelief in themselves through and then through, well, through all sorts of reasons, through generally through history, through their history through um, trauma or being told that they can't do something or squashed down basically, you know, from, from parents, teachers, gurus, all of those like saying that you're, you're just not good enough. And that can have such an effect on us in life as human beings that, you know, we just don't want to stand upon our two feet because we're afraid of it. And we don't know how, or we just don't know how to. Um, yeah, I can't say something specific because every, every personal client is different, but I would say that as that's the main thing I'd say, it's really popped its head up many, many times. In, in fact, in fact, everybody. I've had uh, some really funny experiences there. Uh, what's, it doesn't happen all the time, but just sometimes they do become the same. Like I'll have four sessions of someone with sexual problems and the universe will just be throwing at me <laughs> all of these people with sexual abu abuse or anything like that um and it yeah it does ver it does vary and disbelief is a big thing and for me i've had to work on disbelief um that's some of the inner work i've been doing a lot lately and some of the aspects of where i don't really value myself enough 
Um, and we all have that. We all have those moments where we don't believe in ourselves fully. And with tools like shamanism, it's great because you can fully dive deep into it and start changing it. Yeah, disbelief goes along with lack of self-worth, really. It's about, as you've said, believing in yourself, isn't it? And that's something I see quite a lot. And along with that is not not realising how potent a being you actually are, we actually are, within, and how we can, everything's within. Mm. I know that's a bit of an old cliche, but but it really is. It's, it's within doing the inner work that you can find your potency, and potency is linked to what we were saying earlier, which is sovereignty. And so many people just allow... Oh, just so many things to dictate to their life and they've simply just been conditioned that way and, and don't see beyond that conditioning and the global narrative and, you know, the false light hologram and all that and that's not getting too into any conspiracy thing at all. It's just, just stating what is there and, um, you know, shaman, proper practising shaman choose to live in the natural world like Haley does and that doesn't mean to say you don't live in the 3d life either does it Haley? because you oh, have to, you know you've got to exist in both that's right and that's kind of what you know practitioners or shamans globally do it's like there's you have foot i you know you have one foot in the spirit world the spirit world and one foot here you know there's this absolute bridge between the two i'm completely normal i also just have to make it very clear that i would never call myself a shaman i think you mentioned that earlier laura as well yeah wouldn't it me just just not a practitioner yeah and a healer yes yeah um but that is one thing for sure that happens with me that, you know mm. there is and I'm, I'm 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 the bridge between the two but mm -hmm. normal life ha carries on. I'm a normal person. Absolutely. You know, I have showers in the morning. I wash up. I cook. I do my washing. You know, yeah. it's you have your money in the bank, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. you take cold plunges pay, still. Pay <laughs> you still take the cold plunges, Haley. <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> that's incredible. How how long have you been doing that for? Um, at least two years, I'd say. Wow. Yeah, I did have, I have had little breaks from it, but I've been doing it for quite a little bit now, every day in the morning. It's like as soon as I wake up, it's great. It's that dip in the morning. Yeah. That's my really moment, actually, when I when I said about the, the nature. I'm, in, I'm actually in my bucket, my dustbin of cold water doing that. It's <laughs> 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 That's an interesting vision, Haley. <laughs> <laughs> Not my neighbours can't see. <laughs> so I'd like to go on to as well is a sweat lodge and and the sweat and that ceremony. Would you like to explain a little bit about what a sweat lodge is? Because I've experienced them a few times and been part of doing them, and they are phenomenal. It's something I really want to get back into because I haven't been doing it for a, a good few months. Yeah, so it's um, it's basically if you can just think of a a, a, a bender. So you have hazel poles in a structure like that. Um, very, very. Uh, it's an earth-based ceremony. Very profound. Very simple. Um, yet yeah, incredibly powerful. So you have this structure covered in blankets, covered in tarp, creating darkness entirely dark. It's the womb of Mother Earth. So we heat up um, the grandmothers and the grandfathers, which are the rocks, which are our el eldest relative, basically. That's why we call them our grandparents. And then the grandparents come in to the lodge and um, create heat in the darkness. So it's very simple. You're working with all the four elements. You're working with the four directions. Um, and within within inside the lodge, there's generally four or five rounds, and um, each round has a theme. So it's cleansing and purifying. You pray. There's loads of drumming and singing, um, and gratitude and love and healing. And yeah, it's just like I said, it's it's a simple ceremony working with Mother Nature in her 
true essence. It would not happen without her. And yet it is so powerful. So many people have come out there, hundreds of people come out there just like, my God, wow, what happened to me? We just been, um, and it's just something in that cleansing and purifying process when you completely surrender to it. It's like you just, you just kind of just let go, just let go. It kind of really pushes you to that limit of like, you know, like that control and holding on. It's like, well, you just let go and be held by our mother. And, um, and the preparation for it then, so with each sweat, do you prepare the wood and is it more of a group thing? Do you do it yourself? Um, what's the preparation like for it? Well, with the preparation, like on the day, so we, we, it, it, say we, it's a, it's a community work really. So obviously there's the people that are running myself and my partner are running the, um, the sweat lodge itself, meaning pouring the water. Um, it's all been done. We have, we have the rights to do it through, um, through tradition. So it would pour the water, but then uh, the preparation for it is community. So it's like, yeah, everybody puts the blankets on, people get the water. Um, you know, there's a brush that's being made. And so I run um, women's lodges as well. So that's one passion of mine. So when women, it's, it's mixed lodges as well as women's lodges. Um, they are just as powerful and as beautiful as each other. They're just different. So when women, just like when men come together, when women come together, it's just different. And it's just, I don't know, it's just different when women, that's all I can say. Anything you want to ask Laura about the sweat? Um, would people have to be at a particular level of inner work before they attended the sweat lodge for it? No, it doesn't matter. No. Yeah, it okay. doesn't matter. Just, yeah, yeah, it, yeah don't, you don't, no, not at all. I mean, we've had, again, we have a lot of people in recovery come to lodges. Mm -hmm. um, it's just one of those transition of like completely surrendering and it is quite deep you know it's just like there are and, and so many people coming in um just at the end of recovery literally almost just stepped into recovery and then carried on and we have um within the community like people coming back regular that's what happens you know you just become sweat hogs which is what i call them but there's a good group of people um who come regular or um in recovery and Doing the AA and so I guess a lot of releasing goes on there, you know. Yeah, like, a you lot, know, and I think it's and physically. Yes, physically and spiritually, and also mm. within the community as well. There's just support there as well, and mm -hmm. um, there's something about coming together in nature, in ceremony, and yeah, and just connecting with each other and you don't have to have any experience at all you know most a lot of people started one you know started their first time once you know and mm. it's just people that are coming back regular that are still coming and it involves all the elements and the alchemy of all the combined elements too doesn't it yes yes exactly the beauty so of you're it. working with yeah working with the four directions with um four flags inside the lodge they're the grandmothers and the grandfathers. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you're honoring, honoring all of that. And, you know, with great spirit, you're honoring, um, yeah, mother nature and that we're all connected. I've mm. got a photo of you here, Haley. Oh, my bin. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was cold that morning. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> looking in nature. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm just wondering where you got all that ice from. You must have had to delivered on a lorry. No, that, that England. <laughs> and it was actually frozen. Didn't put any ice in it. That was how it was when we were Really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Like this one that. Oh my god. <laughs> cool. So let, let's bef uh, talk about addiction then in shamanism. So what does addiction look look like for you, Haley, as a shamanic practitioner? Um, I'm not sure of that question. So addiction, so say someone with a drug addiction, alcohol addiction, what yeah. does it look like from your perspective of when you're working with a client? What are some of the things going on there? 
Well, I think I, I maybe mentioned this earlier. I think mm. when when we feel when our soul is damaged or lost or kind of aimed somehow through our upbringing, through you know sexual abuse, verbal abuse, through just not being loved and cherished by parents or whatever stories are with it, our souls become empty. So we, we search for things to fill that up. And I think, I do believe that's one aspect of why um, addiction is in place because we're just they're just we're just searching to fill our selves back up again but we can't so that's we go back for more we go back for more because we can't we're not actually filling ourselves up and i also certainly through the stories that i've heard is you know this search for something greater there is something a belief that there is something more searching for something that they can't actually quite grasp hold of where actually you know it's here and it's it's right with us and that's where the healing with in, in shamanism can happen where those holes can be replaced back with the soul parts and therefore there's no need to go back to filling ourselves up with alcohol or drugs so then would you say also, Haley, it's a covering up of um, unfaced trauma or trauma that you're not able to face definitely. with a distraction? Yeah, definitely. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, through, yeah, just, uh, yeah, just not disassociating, isn't it? It's like not wanting. Yes, yes, that's, yeah, yeah. To uh, acknowledge it at all. And, mm. Yeah. Mm. Let's, let's turn the other way and basically whereas and this that, game as i said if we could do that and have the strength and the courage to actually you know like we've mentioned before about going through the dark night of the soul well that is that is so true you don't have to be a shaman or a shamanic practitioner to go through that but to go through the dark night of the soul the only way through is to to the light to get through it is through it that's yeah absolute fact if you keep running you're just going to keep running away and get more worn down traumatized and more things happen to you until you have the courage to actually turn around and come back yeah and that that's the journey into growth yeah and the self-evolution mm. and that's it it's like even thinking about drinking and the amount of people who drink on weekends, binge drink all the time uh, and give the life away to drinking and working full time, drinking, working full time. Um, it, I feel like it takes from my experience as well, it takes commitment and a lot of courage to get out of that. Um, and you really have to build yourself out of it very slowly, but you've got to have a lot of strength as well. Um, f from me being an addict before in my life, um, it was one of the hardest things I had to overcome in my life, being honest. Um, it was very hard to overcome that side of me but once I did it was like a regain trust to the natural way and I think a lot of people get lost because they don't have the tools and techniques to learn natural living so when they become addicted to something they go on to an antidepressant or they go on to some other drug so they're still limited and they're still like held back the spirits held back and so on so for me uh, the natural way helped me gauge myself out of it uh, moving from drugs and so on and it is it's a hard graft to get out of it it was one of the hardest lessons but i'm so glad i did it and my life is incredible now and it but it took a fucking a lot of honesty and if you have an addiction and you're not being honest the honesty is the first part of addiction you have to be honest with yourself about yourself uh all the shit what goes along with it and so on um and i know a lot of people do struggle with addiction it's so big like i have friends um, who are not really my friends anymore, but a lot of people who have died from alcoholism and I've got a few alco old alcoholic friends from school and so on. So it's so irrelevant and so big still within our society addiction. <coughs> Apologies about slipping off and my battery nearly died. Yet, so it's oh, it's okay. So we're going to wrap up the show anyway, Haley. So it's been an absolute honour, sister, to have you on. 
this evening. It's been so fun and, and you look great and I'm so glad so glad to have you back. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking. I've really enjoyed it and really enjoyed meeting you, Laura. Really yeah, it's been fabulous. Love love sharing this part of the journey with you, Hayley. It's been wonderful. Nothing is gonna tempt me into an ice <laughs> dustbin <laughs> full of morning <laughs> bath no but i i know i'm sure it does and you, you look really good on it so uh i know a lot lot of people do 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 it and uh, it's very good for the immune system isn't it yeah yeah and your general well-being so yeah fabulous to meet you and thanks so much thank for coming you. on thank you and how can people get a hold of you as well for your artwork or sessions if they'd like a shamanic <coughs> session so my website, which is below, Hayley Trezise, T-R-E-Z-I-S-E, dot co dot UK. So that is all. I got some artwork there and my email address is through there too. So any if anybody wants any one-to-one -one healing or come to, I'm doing a, an introduction to shamanism in July and um, shamanic dance with Sweat Lodge in June and a woman's Sweat Lodge in June. So yeah, just any interest anything one-to-one -one healing or sacred mentoring just be in touch email me incredible yeah. sister Fabulous. and laura how, how how can people get a hold of you twofeathersmedicine.com or you'll find me on facebook and yes you will also catch me on my slot now on prayer sunday so come and sit around the shamanic fire and and hear some prayers so yeah anybody want to do a one-to-one -one again um, shamanic self mastery, um, psychic surgery, ancestral healing. I'm an ancestral medium, so anything like that, you know where to to find me. Thank you, Dale. Beautiful sister. And if anybody would like any psychic surgery sessions, I'm also doing a practitioner course starting on the first of May. So if you'd like to learn psychic surgery, um, go on to daletobin.com as well and i just want to say thank you everyone for listening and i really appreciate the comments and feedback as well an incredible show and let's go on thank you Ooh, thank you thanks Haley. thank uh -oh. you bye now everyone